Amen, amen. It is so good for you, for me to see you today. And I'm so glad you're joining us online. We're glad if you are there watching, we encourage you to uh, write notes to one another, pass notes in the chat room and uh, talk during the message, get to know people there and hang out with them. We are continuing in our sermon series from the book of Acts. Today, we're gonna be in Acts chapter nine, beginning in verses one, uh, going through 31. If you're using one of our Bibles, you can find that page. Uh, you can find that on page 1090. And if you don't have a Bible that you brought, uh, there's one located underneath the seat in front of you. And if you don't have one at your house, we invite you to take a Bible home with you. Uh, read it and apply it to your life because we believe that if we read God's word and apply God's word, he will change our lives. And as you all have already seen, we love celebrating life change here at Calvary. Uh, we love it. We love it when the Spirit of God grabs a hold of us and changes us, and we celebrate that. Speaking of life change, today we're reading about Saul's conversion. If anybody ever experienced a drastic life-changing moment, it was Saul. He was a Jewish terrorist. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Pastor Robert taught from Acts chapter 7 on the life and death of Stephen. Stephen was a guy that lived for Jesus. He shared the good news with the Pharisees uh, and the religious leaders, and because he did that, pretty strongly, I might add, those Pharisees and religious leaders grabbed stones and stoned Stephen to death. The reason why that stoning is significant to us today is because Saul was present at that stoning. He heard Stephen, if you remember from Acts chapter 7, with his dying breaths, ask God to forgive the men who were stoning him. And I'm sure that that stuck out to Paul, uh, to Saul, because Saul was a firm believer in eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and Old Testament law. And as these men stoned Stephen to death with Saul present, Stephen begged God for forgiveness for the men that were stoning him. And between the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 9, where we're going to read today, about three years have passed. I know it doesn't feel that way, but three years have passed from Acts 7 to Acts 9. The church in Jerusalem during that three years had been persecuted. The believers had fled. They'd been scattered about. And Saul, the Jewish terrorist, had heard that some of these followers of the way, followers of Jesus, had fled to the city of Damascus. And so he went to the synagogue and asked them for permission to go get those followers of Jesus and drag them back to Jerusalem to kill them and to destroy the spread of the news about Jesus. So let's begin to read together. We're not going to read this entire passage at once because you'll fall asleep. So... We're gonna read just a few nuggets of scripture in this passage. So we're gonna read beginning in Acts chapter nine, verses one and two. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So make no mistake about it, in God's eyes, Saul was a murderer. E even though he wasn't picking up the stones and throwing them at Stephen, he had murder in his heart, he had hatred in his heart, he hated other people, he hated Jesus, he hated the followers of the way. And so in God's eyes, Saul was a murderer. And I'm sure in many of these disciples' eyes, he was as well, because Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. So in, in my opinion, I think as Saul was uh, um, in this murdering mood, I don't know what, how, what else to say it, he knew he watched an innocent man die. I think he was troubled for three years about the way Stephen died. I think he was troubled. This is my opinion, okay? Maybe I need to step out from behind the pulpit. In my opinion, in my opinion, I believe that, Paul, that Saul was, struggled, was, was just eaten up because the way Stephen died was so much hope 
and so much grace was given and so much forgiveness was given, I'm sure that he thought, we just killed an innocent man. I think he felt guilty over Stephen's death and I think that that guilt made him go further away from God. I mean, have you ever done something uh, like that with people? Have you ever treated somebody so poorly and then you felt ashamed about it and about how you treated them and instead of apologizing, instead of making things right, you distanced yourself from them? So raise your hand if you've ever treated somebody poorly then avoided them because you felt bad. I think, I really think that that's what was going on here with Stephen. Likewise, if you're a follower of Jesus, have you ever felt guilty over doing something wrong and you move further away from God because you felt guilty? Has that ever been you? See, that happens. Guilt can either help motivate us toward repentance or guilt can cause us to dive deeper into sin and spend our lives running from our past. I'm so glad that we had the people here today to share about Faith and Grace, the domestic violence shelter. I spent time in a domestic violence shelter as a child. And today, as I share Saul's story, I'm gonna share a little bit about my story as well. I believe that my dad also wrestled with guilt and shame. And yet, instead of allowing that guilt and shame to motivate him towards loving God, he sunk deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. He could not let go of the guilt that he had for destroying our house night after night after night in fits of rage, so he kept on drinking alcohol. He could not let go of the guilt and the shame of spending almost every penny on beer, so he kept on drinking. He could not let go of the regret that he could never hold down a full-time job to support his family because of his drinking and that we were being raised on food stamps and welfare. He kept on drinking because he could not he could not let go of the shame and the guilt of showing pornographic movies to his son and then touching him. And by the way, I mean me. He could not let go of the guilt and the shame of his, the time his eight-year-old son, that's me again, walked into the bedroom and saw him raping my mom. He could not let go of the shame that he was such an abusive spouse that his wife left him and went to a domestic violence shelter in Nashville, Tennessee. So he kept on drinking. He kept on seeking relief from the memories of the sin that he had done, of the pain that he had caused. And my dad was also caught up in a circle of abuse as well. He couldn't get out of the past that had happened to him from his dad when his dad sexually abused him. So he kept on drinking and he kept on drinking and he kept on being pushed, uh, allowing himself to grow further and further and further away from change. Years later, as a 25 year old man, I held his hand as he struggled to breathe his last breaths in a VA hospital in Florida. I pleaded to him as I held his hand to trust in Jesus as his savior and Lord and receive forgiveness for his sins. Through my crying and through my tears, I reminded him that I had forgiven him for what he had done. And all he's got to do is turn his life over to Jesus and he will forgive him as well. And even though his death certificate says that he died of cancer, I know my dad and I know that he died of drinking, of guilt and of shame. He never took care of himself and he never could let go of the past. And I hate that because God can change anybody. God can change anybody, even you. Write your name in there on that blank. See, God can change anybody. I, I'm living proof that God can change anybody. I, I praise God that because of what Jesus has done in my life, because I surrender my life to Jesus, that I have now hope. I've been, I've been forgiven for my past. And through Christ, that circle of violence and that circle of abuse was shattered and broken. And that my children get to grow up with a daddy that loves Jesus and a mama that loves Jesus and parents that love them, even when we spank their little behinds. I mean, I'm grateful that God can change anybody and God can change you 
too. Now, Saul, he was on his way to persecute followers of Jesus. He hated Jesus' followers. He hated Jesus. But then something completely unexpected happened to him in verse 3. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. This was a moment that God began breaking Saul. For three days, Saul was blinded by God. For three days, he walked in total darkness. Now he could see nothing except his past sins. And in my opinion, he saw nothing but that stoning of Stephen. He could see nothing except his shame and guilt. For three days, Saul realized that God could have taken his life on that road to Damascus, but instead realized that even while Saul was a murderer, God was still for him. And instead of entering into Damascus a tyrant and a threat, Saul entered Damascus blinded and timid. Three days later, a man named Ananias, who was a follower of Jesus, was sent by God to pray for Saul. And we pick back up in verse 17. So Ananias departed. If you want to know what happened in between, just read later on. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. Now understand this. Saul was not changed on the road to Damascus. Saul was broken on the road to Damascus. He was changed in Damascus. Saul encountered Jesus on the road, but he was not transformed. He was not born again until three days later when he received the Holy Spirit and he became a new person. Now, God could have transformed my dad at any moment if my dad had surrendered his life to him and receive Jesus as his savior. And God is willing to change your life if you are willing to surrender your life over to him and receive Jesus as your savior. Now I'm gonna share a little bit of uncomfortable news, okay? This is gonna make you feel uncomfortable. The Bible teaches us that all have sinned and all fall short of heaven. Isaiah 53, six says, all of us, raise your hand if you're included in all or us. Some of you didn't, you raise your hand, you're not paying attention. <laughs> gotta pay attention, I gotta move fast. Chad took up a long time at the front of the sermon. <laughs> all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own and the Lord God has laid on him, Jesus, the sins of us all. All always means all. From the kid that was abused to the man that did the abusing, we have all sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. See, Jesus died for the sins of the abuser and for the sins of the abused. You ready to get uncomfortable? Jesus died for the sins of the pedophile and for the sins of the children. Jesus died for the sins of the terrorist, and he died for the victims of the terrorist. And if the abuser, if the pedophile, if the terrorist surrenders their life to Jesus and becomes a follower of Christ, then when we get to heaven, 
we may be worshiping God with our hands outstretched right beside a person that abused children. Raise your hand if you can admit that makes you a little uncomfortable. Yeah, it does. This is where God's grace gets uncomfortable because we say every weekend that God can change anybody, but then we go, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, that makes me a little uncomfortable. And if you're a victim of abuse and your abuser has trusted in Jesus, when you get to heaven, they may be right beside you with their hands outstretched in worship to God, worshiping him. Instead of hurting you, they're now worshiping God and God calls them innocent. See, that, that is how strong the cross is. That is how redeeming the cross is. God is able to change and transform anybody for forgiveness. And when Jesus cried out in the garden, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt that pain. He felt the agony of every sin ever committed. And he felt the emptiness that it brought. He didn't just die and pay the penalty for white lies and cheating on taxes. He didn't just, didn't just pay, the, pay the price for adultery. I think we are uncomfortable with that truth right now, but in heaven, we're not gonna care. In heaven, it's not going to be uncomfortable, but it does cause us to get a little squirmy in our seats. And you're like, pastor, that's enough. Stop talking, okay. <laughs> Years later, after he was changed by God, Saul became known to the Christian community as Paul. He became known as the Apostle Paul, and he wrote about this uncomfortable grace in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 11. He said this, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? And all the Pharisees and us want to say, oh yes, praise the Lord, right? Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. If you have that passage open in your Bible, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, emphasize that passage. Some of you were once like that. See, if you indulge in sexual sin, God can change you. If you have committed adultery, God can change you. If you have used your body sexually to get what you want, God can change you. If you practice homosexuality, God can change you. If you are a thief, God can change you. If you're a greedy or a drunk or abusive and cheat people, God can change you. See, the apostle Paul knew that grace was available to all because he knew he was a murderer. He knew that he was a persecutor of the people that followed Jesus before he gave his life to the Lord. That's why Paul was able to say, I'm a chief of sinners, but God changed me. He wrote to the Roman church in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So hear me on this. You may have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus. Today, if you understand that God loves you, if you understand that Jesus paid the price for your sin when he died on the cross, if you understand that through Jesus, God can forgive you and give you a second or third chance, our prayer team is gonna be here at the close of the last song, at the close of this service. If you will take that first step 
and come forward at that last song or after that last song and let our prayer team know you would love to begin a relationship with Jesus and be forgiven for your sins. They would love to lead you to that life-changing moment like Paul had when he met Jesus and then three days later when Ananias prayed for him. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you. If you've sinned in such a way that is known and it's known to your family or it's known to the public, some people may doubt you have really been changed. Some people may doubt that you have really been changed. In Acts 9, 26, uh, we see what happened after Saul became a follower of Jesus. He was in town with the Damascus disciples. I guess their club name was Dede. He was in town with the Damascus disciples and he was preaching in Damascus. He was telling people about Jesus in Damascus. And then in verse 26, when he had come to Jerusalem, now he's returning from Damascus. Look what happened. He attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. I love that because that just shows the humanity of these followers of Jesus. They're like, wait, grace changed him? I mean, he was there when Stephen was stoned. He's been breathing murdering, murderous threats down the back of our, uh, uh, down the, he's been breathing murderous, Never mind. He's been threatening us. They knew him as a Jewish thug. They knew him as a Jewish mafia. They knew him as the guy that was destroying the faith and destroying people's lives. And they were afraid that he was still that Jewish thug just trying to infiltrate their holy huddle, their circle. And that's because Saul was well known as a bad guy. Now I can relate to that a little bit. After I worked constru after high school, after I graduated from high school, that's when I surrendered my life to Jesus. And then I went to work immediately on a construction crew the day after I graduated from high school. So before I gave my life to Jesus, and I'm out there all the time saying exactly what construction workers say. You know, filth and foul coming out of my mouth all the time, dirty jokes, ca dirty jokes, cat calls to women, you know, just, just kind of vulgar, vulgar guy. I gave my life to Jesus on a Wednesday midweek. On Thursday, I showed up completely changed. I mean, I felt like I was an altar boy, okay? I, I felt like, oh, hello, brethren. Let's lay some brick today in the name of the Lord Jesus. They ridiculed me for surrendering my life to Jesus. My grandmother did not believe me. She told me that I was brainwashed. That fall, after I began to grow in my relationship with Jesus over the summer, the local high school was still having dances. Uh, they had this big area in the parking lot where they would have a dance at the end of every homecoming football game or at the end of every home football game. And so I went back to those dances and I found the kids that I had picked on, that I had laughed at, that I had degraded, that I had called names, that I was mean to. I found them and I told them, man, I am so sorry about the way I treated you for, for three years in high school. I should never have done it. I'm ashamed of myself and I'm so sorry. You know, those kids that I went to and I talked to, I told them that I had given my life to Jesus. They did not doubt the change in my life. They didn't doubt that I'd been changed because they saw it. They saw me going back to them and telling them I was an idiot, I was a jerk, I was messed up, and I'm sorry for what I did. I couldn't, I couldn't lead my grandmother to Jesus. She died rejecting the gospel a few years after my dad died. But both my dad and my grandmother had been able to see change in my life because I kept going back to that high school as I grew my relationship with the Lord. And then I got involved with FCA and then I was invited to go and lead and speak Bible studies. And then in the same high school where I was picking on kids, I was now leading them to Jesus and sharing the gospel with them. So if people doubt you have really been changed by Jesus, prove them wrong by living a transformed life. You catch that? Prove them wrong by living a transformed life. 
Now you can't convince anybody that you've been changed, but you've got to bear the fruit of the spirit in your life if you've been forgiven. If you've been born again, you need to live like you've been born again. You don't fall back in that old lifestyle of sin. Are you gonna sin? Yes. Are you gonna seek forgiveness? Yes. But bear the fruit of the spirit in your life. Look what happened. Barnabas came along beside. The disciples were acting in fear. They didn't want anything to do with Saul. And Barnabas, in verse 27, took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. See, the reason why Barnabas could go to the apostles and defend Saul is because he had seen Saul's transformation. He had known about Paul, uh, Saul preaching the gospel in Damascus. He had known that the man who had resisted God's grace and persecuted believers was now leading other people to Jesus. The man who was headed to Damascus to try to destroy the faith of believers actually went to Damascus to lead other people to Jesus. Isn't it awesome how God works? So even if you feel like you're in that broken season of waiting for God to move, God will redeem because that is what he does best. So keep looking for opportunities to love your family, love your neighbors, lead them to Jesus, get involved in serving. If you miss serving our schools this weekend, get involved, Uh, join a ministry team. And let me just have a public confession. I double booked my life. I was supposed to serve Friday night with my life group. And when I called my wife to tell her that I was on my way, she said, "Uh, you're cooking Sophie's birthday dinner. Oops, so confession, I did not make it on Friday. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Okay. I got afraid for a minute. Thought I was gonna be ridden out of town on a rail. Get involved in serving. Prove to the world you've been changed. Let them see the light of Jesus Christ radiate from you. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray together. Father, we love you, and we wanna say thank you for loving us. Thank you for redemption. Thank you for changing Saul. Thank you that you changed him so drastically, so powerfully, that he was able to speak into the lives of us today. That you were able to use the words that you spoke to him 2,000 years ago, as he breathed your word out onto parchment, it can change our lives today. So Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for the grace that's available to all. And thank you for the fact that you can change anybody. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.